Hi, I'm Harry Rich. Uh, I'm at the AAGL meeting in uh, Washington, in Washington DC. DC, our company's <laughs> capital. I'm here with uh, my good friend Lisa Lott Mettler, who uh, has been for many years in Kiel, Germany, and now you're doing some private work, I've heard, in Dubai. Yes, well, I'm Lisa Lott Mettler from the Kiel University Department, now having a little job at the Harvard Medical School, German Clinic, Dubai. Yes. And uh, we just edited a book on hysterectomies, um, which nicely went on the market. Now, Harry, I would like to ask you, you've written two chapters in the book, one on the past and one on the present and future of hysterectomies. Mm -hmm. What uh, part would you like to comment about? I'd like to comment about uh, the new coding for hysterectomy that just became available, uh, I heard, at this meeting. Uh, starting uh, in the beginning of this next year, there'll be a code for total laparoscopic hysterectomy. It's ironic that this is an operation I've been doing for over 20 years, and finally there's a way to bill for it. That's lovely. I mean, my teacher, Kurt Sim, he always tried to bill for infertility treatment. It finally came on the market, was taken out again. So mm -hmm. if we are now in the U.S. for hysterectomy with a laparoscopic approach, it's beautiful. Well, I have concerns because uh, I'll wait till I see what the codes look like, but uh, one of the most important uh, parts of doing a total laparoscopic hysterectomy has always been to get proper pelvic support at the end of the operation. In other words, not just to close the cuff, but to bring the ligaments together and uh, in some cases, uh, even uh, repair the high cystocele during the same point of the operation. Now, I am sure that this code will probably come out and will say nothing about any support, which would be terrible. That would be terrible. But tell me now, what are the essential steps that should be done in the future for laparoscopic total hysterectomy? Laparoscopic total hysterectomy means that the whole operation is done laparoscopically with the exception of the morselation portion uh, with the large uterus. So laparoscopic hysterectomy is meant to be an operation for extensive endometriosis where the rectum is stuck to the cervix. So before the surgeon does the hysterectomy part portion, surgeon should take the endometriosis off the rectum, excise it, excise it from the cervix and other areas that it's present. Uh, at that point, the surgeon can then uh, proceed and do a total laparoscopic hysterectomy. But like I said, the other thing is morselation, still best done vaginally and uh, still best done with a large uterus using a coring technique. Um, you could use some of the available morselators on the market, but I think it's best to do them vaginally. The operation itself, in most cases, involves uh, bipolar desiccation of the major blood supply of the uterus. That means the artery between the uterus and the ovaries or the artery to the ovaries. Uh, after dissection, one should then skeletonize the uterine vessels, and I believe it's best to put a suture around each uterine artery. Thereafter, do, you, do you think that any of the new plasma kinetics or other um, electrical possibilities we have, are they adding to the procedure? Are they making it more better? I think for many people it's a little faster. Only I mean, faster. But, but we, is it more secure? I think uh, you could use a, the, the Kleppinger bipolar forcep from uh, the early 70s. Probably works almost as, as nice, but I've seen some of these new devices where the bipolar is applied and the pedicles then cut right with one uh, instrument. I think that's quite nice. Uh, do you personally prefer suturing or using any of those coagulation co technologies and cutting? There's a tremendous advantage to suturing the uterine artery. Namely, if you look with the cystoscope at the end of the operation and there's no urine coming from one ureter, you can always go back and take off your suture. If you've used bipolar, forget it. You need to do an implantation of that ureter if you injure it. Now you mentioned that majorly for endometriosis, the TLH um, has a good indication. But do you see other indications for TLH? 
uh, I think with the large fibroid uterus, uh, most gynecologists don't feel uh, comfortable doing that operation vaginally. I stress that if you could do a vaginal hysterectomy, you should do a vaginal hysterectomy. And everyone has different limits for the vaginal approach. Now let me put one final question. What kind of hysterectomies are in the future, in your um, estimation, going to be done by laparotomy anymore? <laughs> well, not many. Uh, in the United okay. States, still uh, well over 70% are done by laparotomy. But I've been in institutions. <laughs> I've been in institutions in Europe where even the cancer with the cervix and the endometrial are done by superb laparoscopic surgeons who uh, can do aortic pelvic lymph nodes uh, laparoscopically. It's it, it's incredible. So some of that has to come to the United States sooner or later. But the United States has already some robotic, very good oncological surgeons, and they show the path. So let's just think 30 years ahead of time. My vision is that we do not need laparotomy at all anymore. What do you think? Uh, I'd say years. like 1% might need laparotomy, and I don't think it's because of the robot. I think the robot is laparoscopy. And I think if you're a good laparoscopic surgeon, you will not need the robot. And I foresee that some of these great uh, robotic surgeons will, in the next few years, stop using the robot, too, as they learn how to suture without We will use it. robotic instruments, as we have at this AGL meeting presented, to a cheap way, without mm -hmm. the, the two million Da Vinci, right? I think you're right. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.